I'll give you one. Okay, thank I, I you. I still all had yours last night. I didn't give it to you. But I welcome. Have it I'll give it to you. And so today I'm going to give a very fast and broad overview of the geology of the Hawaiian Islands. And this is an image from uh, December 2022, and this is what we just missed out on. And I'm very sorry, this is uh, Mount Aloha erupting for the first time in over, within my lifetime, so more than 40 years. Um, and most of what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is actually from a class that I took at the University of Hawaii at Hilo in 2007. And so I'm just gonna bring you back, me 15 years ago. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Boom. So here we go. Geology of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, yeah, I couldn't grow a beard because it was too hot and it was awkward. Um, and so this is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about today is what kind of got me interested in geology in the first place. So I went to UH Hilo and wanted to do sports management. I took a business class, no offense to any business people. I hated it and I thought I should try a new life path. Um, then as soon as you play with lava, kind of changes you a little bit. And I wish I could share that with you guys on this trip, but Madame Pele does her thing and we're not unable to do that. So. Um, we're going to kind of walk through mostly what Geology 205 at UH Hilo would be, but instead of it being a semester-long course, we're going to do it in about 50 minutes, if I can get through all the slides. So, before we get to that, I would like to just talk briefly about Hawaii in general. And um, what I'm going to share with you is my very basic knowledge of the Hawaiian language and hopefully this might help you guys understand road signs, where we're going, stuff like that. And come on through, don't worry about it. We're late, I'm sorry for coming. It's okay. I'm actually not a professor, so I don't even worry about that. Uh, I'm getting chocolate. Oh, share? Did you bring enough for the whole class? <laughs> <laughs> um, Perfect response. But yeah, so I think it's it's very important to talk about at least the indigenous people that were here before us. And so I'm going to speak briefly on Oleo Hawaii, which is, um, and just kind of talk a little bit about the Hawaiian language in general. And so the Hawaiian language is phonetic. And so if you just break it down into basic segments, it will help you at least come up with names on the street side. And the nice thing is, there's only 13 letters. That's half as many as the regular English language. And there's a little bit of difference in that we have all of our vowels, but instead of A, E, I, O, U, we have A, A, E, O, U. So if you just shift them back one level, then you're there. And then we have Things dying already. Um, then we have H, K, L, M, N, P, and W. And W can also have a V sound. And the nice thing, oh, and then sorry, and then at the end is the Okina, which is a glottal stop. So what you would do when you would say, uh oh. So it's just a brief little break in a word. And every consonant is followed by a vowel. So you will never see two consonants next to each other. And it makes it very easy to break it down into simple segments. So if you say things like Kona, there we go, we're here. Or Hilo, or sometimes you will have multiple vowels next to each other. And so then you would have Ha, Vai, Hilo with the Okina in there. And when I went through, when I was a, or an undergraduate student, we had to take Hawaiian classes. And so one of them is, they asked this old Hawaiian lady and they said, how do you say the word Hawaii? She's like, well, there's four options. You can say Hawaii, you can say Hawaii, you could say Hawaii or Hawaii. So the W and the V, you might get slightly different things. And then if you get a double Kilauea, which is the most active volcano on the island itself. Does that make sense? Just break it down into like two to three segments, and you'll mostly get there. There are words I will struggle with forever. Um, so, put all the letters in one word. Uh, there are some, 
if you went out snorkeling today, you might have seen the Hawaiian triggerfish. Actually, it doesn't even get all of them. But that would be humu humu nuku u aupua. Huh? And that's the same fish in Hawaii. Can you spell it? Uh, <laughs> later. Yeah, later. Later. Um, but I just want to at least introduce the islands themselves. And so we are on the island of Hawaii. And the next one up, and we'll go for biggest and then most difficult. Then you have the island of Maui, you have the island of Kahoholabe, the island of Lanai, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai, and Nihiha. And this is what most people think of when they think of the Hawaiian Islands, the eight main islands. And uh, only seven of them are inhabited. So the big island of Hawaii, Maui, Lanai, which is well known for its pineapples because it was a Dole pineapple plantation, uh, if you think of Bob Dole. Uh, Molokai is probably one of the least inhabited islands. Oahu, where Honolulu is. Kauai, and then Niihau, which is actually a privately owned island and where Hawaiian uh, is the first and native language of that island itself. And so to get there, you have to be invited to go. All right, so we're going to talk about the history and how the Hawaiian Islands have formed. And there are four main things that kind of bring this together. We have the hot spot, which we are going to talk on the least. And the hot spot creates the volcanoes. Then we're going to talk, actually, we're not really going to talk about volcano or plate tectonics. We're just going to believe that it's happening because it does. <laughs> We're going to talk about water because the ocean and rain are also helping evolve these islands. And then um, the, the biological material or the coral that's happening in the ocean. These are the four main things that are driving uh, the formation and uh, the eventual destruction of these islands. So a brief introduction to the Hawaiian hotspot. We're just going to believe it is here. It is happening. There is a warm plume from the mantle up to the surface of the uh, oceanic crust, forming volcanoes. We're going to leave it there. It's very basic. This is zero petrology. Um, but we're just going <coughs> to believe that it's there. And this is why we have the islands themselves. And what we'll notice is that from, oh yeah, I'm this side. Yep. What we have is from. Our biggest island, off to the northwest, we get older and we get smaller. So that is what we're going to talk about with the Hawaiian hotspot. There's plenty to discuss about it. There's compositional differences between Kilauea and Mauna Loa and other volcanoes. But we're just going to say there's a hot place where magma's coming to the surface and we're OK with it. And, and for those of you who are on the uh, Yellowstone field trip, remember, it's a very similar story. Yeah. Yeah, the plume, um, the, uh, plate moving over the plume. logistics of it, yeah. Yeah, so we're just going to believe that for now and talk about how the islands are building and, and deconstructing over time. So if we strip away the water part of this and we just look at the islands themselves, we will notice that these are very large land masses and very large volcanoes. And Mauna Loa is the largest volcano on our planet. And Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain on our planet. If you take it from the ocean floor up to the top, it is over 4,000 feet taller than Mount Everest. So these are massive structures. And Mount Everest itself is just a mountain on top of other mountains. This is a mountain on top of a flat basaltic plate surrounded by water. So it just doesn't look as impressive. But when we get up there, when Van leads us up to the top of Mount Okea to where these observatories are, we can understand a little bit more of this, this majestic uh, volcano itself. <clears throat> and what you will notice is that some of these land masses are similar sizes, but the exposure of the stuff above the ocean surface is actually diminishing as we're going from where the active volcanoes are to the older islands. And if you didn't know, 
the Hawaiian Islands are actually much longer than just the seven inhabited islands down here. So this is the actual extent of the Hawaiian uh, chain, including the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which most of them are not exposed above sea level. And a lot of this is actually part of a uh, marine preserve where people are not allowed to go unless they're like shipwrecked or dealing with uh, other scientific instrumentation or studying these life forms. Um, and this goes all the way up to, many people might know Midway Island. There was a gigantic battle during World War II there. And Kure Atoll, where the last bit of land above the sea actually occurs along this chain. So there's a lot more going on than what is just seen at the surface. And so most people, when they think of the Hawaiian Islands, they think of the main eight islands itself. What's going on down there? Down here? Well, this is all going on with, since there's plate tectonics, you have seamounts that grow from the mid-ocean ridge at different rates. And so it's this is, in the end, random noise of volcanic activity, not necessarily associated with hotspot volcanism. Um, but we will kind of get to that, I think, in the next slide. So we zoom further back out, and we just look at the whole Pacific. And there's only one star, which is the most important star for all of us here, which is Socorro. And if you ever took a petrology class and used a book by uh, Winters, if you opened up the front page, there was only ever one location on there, which was Walla Walla, Washington, which was where Whitman College was, and that's where John uh, Winters was actually teaching at. So this is my, my attempt to be as cool as him. And so there's the coral for your frame of reference, just barely on the edge of it. And we see that we have the Hawaiian chain coming along here. And as Jonna uh, also brought up, there are other lines that kind of show up. And these lines represent what we know of plate tectonics in the last X amount of years. And we'll, we'll give you an answer here in a second. But if you notice one thing with the Hawaiian Islands themselves, there's this giant hockey stick, right turn, that happens. And so what are two possible things that could happen? Any ideas? This is the uh, interaction with the audience part of it. This is what's on your quiz. Wrong answer. Plates running into each other. So, so did the plates switch directions? They decided let's go, what, about 60 degrees in another direction? Fault line, different plates. Maybe, or the other option, and so here's the main Hawaiian chain, and here's the Emperor's Seamounts, and here's the age progression of, progression of these. So from erupting three months ago, up until about 42 million years ago, and then we have this big hockey stick to the north going back to about 60 million years. And what ended up happening is that the hot spot was actually moving from about 60 million years ago to about 40 million years ago. And so using geochronology and paleomagnetism, they have figured out that the hot spot was moving and drifting and then shifted and then has potentially slowed down and or come to a stop in its movement. And so it was just very conveniently moving along with plate direction. And we can use these other lineations in the ocean to at least tell us about what's been happening in the last 40 million years. So, big takeaway from this is basically, it's mostly a mixture of a potentially stationary hotspot and a moving plate across that hotspot. Prior to that, the hotspot was also moving. How was the hotspot Exactly. No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so exactly in, in, this, is, this is part of it is that the, the traditional way of thinking of hotspots is you have a candle and you have a piece of paper or a plate moving over the top of it. And the candle doesn't move, but the plate does. But why does this have to stay stationary? And in this, at least it shows that it's probably not uh, based off of, of paleomagnetic information. And given that the mantle's convecting, it's not yeah. that surprising. Um, so, and I think the other part of it is so the last piece of 
material above the seafloor or above the ocean is that just past Midway Atoll at Curie Atoll. So we're trying to then map out what is happening well below the ocean surface. So we just might not have the information available to know what's going on. And much of this research has happened since 2008. So I actually, Bill was the one that told me about this. I didn't even learn this when I was in Hawaii. Yeah, so. when, I, when I went back to your class notes from when you took it, there's a figure that shows, Paleomag shows that the plate, that the uh, hotspot didn't move. Yeah. But since then, they've really changed. Thinking. Yeah, it was, a, it was a paper in 2008 that came out. And I took this class in 2007. <laughs> so like you're learning some new stuff, <laughs> some old stuff. And for some people in this room, did you actually have plate tectonics in your lectures? Yep. So a couple yeah, ladies up front yeah. told me they, they were the first people that learned about plate tectonics late in their undergraduate career. So it's crazy that from the 1960s and 70s, things are still evolving, even from 2008 and forward. So. Uh, you said you who studies, who the studies? Oh, a lot of this is done by um, ocean island, or ocean uh, drilling people, so like Oregon State, the University of Hawaii at Manoa on, the, on uh, Oahu. There's there's a number of, of different research entities that are, are interested in, in understanding these things. Do they talk to one another? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's at least out and you can Google it. Um, all right. So the next question is, why do these islands get smaller as we move to the Northwest? And what is happening is that we have our hot spot, which is raising the crust up ever so slightly. And as we're building up this volcano and moving mass from in the mantle to the surface of the, of the earth, we're actually creating new weight and pushing down on the crust itself. So everything we're gonna talk about is a next mixture of hot spot buoyancy, so inflation or raising up of the, the crust itself, the mass of the volcanoes and erosion. There's like a little inset. And so what we have is here's a um, pretty rough bathymetry of the Hawaiian Islands. And we have this place called the Hawaiian Deep surrounded by the Hawaiian Arch, which is actually a bulging of the mantle around it in a horseshoe-like shape. And so we have, if you were to take lavas erupted at sea level, they actually shift and move down as you get further away from the hotspot itself. So it's, it's sloping down as the islands get more heavy and dense with water and alteration, and as they're coming off the hotspot itself. And part of the reason why we know this is happening, and if you guys remember when we were on the submarine today, is coral reefs only like to happen at certain depths. And this is a place called the photic zone, which in the end is down to about 600 feet. And off the coast of the big island in Kohala, so we're actually down about here in Kona, you can go and map the, the bathymetry of these reefs as they sink further down into the ocean. And so presently, within a couple hundred feet of the surface, we have reefs from about 15,000 years ago. And this is just after glacial periods where the water level, sea level is lower and broader in the Hawaiian Islands. So you have these big reef caps that form at 15,000 years ago, 125,000 years ago, 250, 350, 450. And this follows glacial periods. And you can actually map them going successively deeper and deeper until you hit just lava flows. And this 450,000 year old reef is over 3,000 feet below sea level right now, which ends up being about two millimeters per year of subsidence on the volcanoes themselves. So they're slowly sinking. We're trying to build them back up and keep them around, but they just want to keep going away. And so the next kind of series of slides are going to talk about the other evolution that's going on with the volcanoes themselves as they're tiny little volcano puppies on the surface of the seafloor as they come to these big massive shield volcanoes. So the first stage 
is the submarine uh, shield building stage. And there's one volcano that is actively coming up to the surface. And if I gave this presentation one year ago, we would only call that the Loihi Seamount, which would mean long coming mountain, because they think it might show up somewhere between 300 and 500,000 years into the future. <laughs> Last year, they changed it to Kama Ekahua Kanaloa. Um, so that's now the name of this, this volcano. And it is below sea level by about 1,500 meters, or um, 3,000, no, 4,000 feet below sea level. And the last time that this volcano erupted was in 1996. And they have seismic equipment on the big island that can see and <coughs> locate volcanic activity of, of this seamount under the ocean. And so this is this small band right here is this new active volcano. So they're all, they're all they've been inter interconnected. So how That's a great question that we're not gonna get into. <laughs> but, so, all right, I guess we're getting into it. Um, so there are two lineages of geochemical affinity. There is the Mauna Loa lineage and there's the Kilauea lineage. And so from Loihi, you can go to Mauna Loa, you can go to Hualalai, and you can go to a place over here that's also submerged called Mahukona. And we're not actually, that's the only time I hopefully will say that name. Um, and then from Kilauea, you have Mauna Kea, Kohala, Haleakala. So there's these two parallel bands with slightly different chemical compositions. And so one of the questions that always comes up is, well, is Kilauea just a parasitic cone of Mauna Loa? And, or, and geochemically, it seems that they are distinct pathways of material. And so what is happening at this volcano at the moment is we have molten rock coming to the surface in the water. And have you guys ever put, um, have you ever thrown ice onto a hot pan? What happens to the ice? Sizzles, Sizzles it boils, it you know moves. And it, it could potentially fragment. And so this is mostly built up of fragmented material and maybe some pillow basalt. So there might be some solid materials, but it's a lot of sand and glass and pretty unstructurally sound material. We'll get into that in a little bit. So the next stage, as we're moving up, as this, this edifice is building, we are moving to the interface with the, the subaerial world, or the world that we interact with. And this is called the emergent stage. And so we're building this volcanic material up on, you know, mostly um, pillow basalts, high site, which means fragmented materials, hot rocks, and we're just building up this big sand mound with some inner layers of solid material. And there's no present analogy in the Hawaiian Islands for this. But if you remember to about one years ago, with the eruption of Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapae <laughs> in um, the yeah, Kingdom of Tonga, we had this two islands, so Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hapae, that formed into one island, and then it just blew apart. And so that's kind of this intermediate phase where the volcano is interacting with the surface. So you have subaerial eruptions mixed with water mixing with magma. And you can have these extremely explosive interactions. So then, once you build up enough fresh material at the surface, you get into this shield building stage. And this would include Kilauea and Mauna Loa volcano the two most active volcanoes in the Hawaiian Islands today. And during this time, you typically will have eruptions every five to 10 years, or any two weeks ago. <laughs> and what you have is the magma chamber is moving up into the edifice itself. It's, it's protected and shielded away from all this terrible ocean water. But then you still have these clastic sediments on the edge with a big um, 
amount of material of solid rock. And so you're, you've just now built a nice big cap on a pile of sand. And this will become problematic. I'm sorry that we're all standing on sand. Uh, but there's some, there's some lava in between. And so the picture on the right is the eruption at Mauna Loa from Mauna Kea um, last uh, December. And so lots of people spectating and visiting as this, this big volcano erupted for the first time since 1983. Did you get to see it? I did not. I'm, I was with you guys, so I missed it. Yeah. I'm actually possibly the reason why Kilauea shut off <laughs> and, like 13 days ago. So, yeah, you, you can, I will take the blame fully. I did, she didn't answer. <laughs> um, but then, as we build these things up, I've been alluding to this problem of collapse. And there are different amounts of collapse and different features that we can see. And we can see this today at Kilauea. We will see some of this from Mauna Loa, and then kind of big catastrophic things like we see on Molokai. And so today at Kilauea, which is on the side of this bigger edifice, Mauna Loa, Kilauea has no things holding back its southeast side. And so as it builds up, it wants to move to where there's less pressure. And so it can't move towards Mauna Loa because that's uphill and a bigger edifice. So it has to move out towards the ocean. The ocean is actually, uh, believe it or not, slightly weaker than rock. Um, <laughs> despite the ocean being a very uh, big and vast and scary thing. And so what we have here is the Kilauea caldera. Here's the rift zone, comes like this, has a big kink, and then runs out this way. It is buttressed against Mauna Loa it has nothing holding it going off to the south and east. And so if you look at GPS measurements, all of this is slowly sliding at a fairly regular interval. And so people ask the question, is the eruptions at Kilauea causing the sliding or is the sliding causing the eruptions? Your guess is as good as mine. You know, is it a chicken or an egg problem? Probably. Um, I, I think it's probably the sliding is causing eruptions, but when you add magma to the summit, it's probably causing more sliding, maybe a positive feedback loop. So, and so what we end up having, and so we'll drive in like four, three or four days time up to Kilauea Caldera, and we may make it all the way down here where we can see, excuse me, the Helena Poly system, which is this big landslide system that is slowly happening. And so here's the Helena Poly slump here as it's moving slowly down. And what we have is a mixture of, well, there's nothing holding this side together, but it's also an uphill slope because the volcanoes are so massive they're depressing the crust. So there's some stability, but what is the level and timing of this problem? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we can go back. Sorry. Maybe. Are you going to be back up here? Yeah. Kilauea. Kilo 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 Is that the sea levels? It's a sea level. And Mauna Loa is high. Yeah. So we'll get into that in a moment, but okay. Kilauea okay. Summit is 4,000 feet. Okay. Mauna Loa is over 13,500 feet. So yeah, there is a volcano at least twice the size of this volcano right here in terms of elevation. And I guess that's, that's fairly well exampled over here. Oh, all right. And so what are some potential mechanisms of this? And I told you I wasn't gonna talk about petrology, but we're gonna give a little brief petrology. And part of this could be, and is probably driven by this, is as you have a melt, and who here remembers Bowen's reaction series? <laughs> I wish, oh, we don't have a whiteboard, we're not gonna write it out. <laughs> so what are the first things that come out when you crystallize in a melt? Is it quartz? 
Okay, that's the last one. All right, we got that one out of the way. <laughs> all of it. So it'll be olivine and pyroxene, which are the most dense, iron and magnesium. They end up having uh, specific densities somewhere around three. Uh, most volcanic rocks are somewhere down around, around two and a half, two and three quarters. And so what we have is we have olivine crystallizing out. And as it crystallizes out, it's more dense than the liquid itself. And it sinks to the bottom. And so you have these things called olivine cumulates. And olivine, the uh, mineral term of it is peridot. Anybody else born in August? Do they have peridot as a birthstone? That's my peridot. That's my birthstone. Uh, it's possibly my second favorite mineral behind sanidine. Um, and so as this crystallizes out, because it's more dense, it starts to build this pile. And if you had a bag of marbles and you set it down, what's going to happen to your bag of marbles? It's going to flatten out like a pancake. And so you have this pancake flattening out, and it might be pushing this... <coughs> unbuttressed wedge out towards the ocean. And so is that what's driving our failures? Probably, in, in some level. Is it the only thing? Maybe not, but in some ways. <coughs> so we have all of those things happening to these volcanoes. We built them up, but now we're under their own mass and their own um, evolution. They're slowly killing themselves. And, and allowing them to return back to the ocean. So, an island built on sand and glass will not withstand at least 40 million years. Um, and so, if we look back to other places where we have this collapse feature, and we will see this as we go south on Sunday towards South Point and Green Sand Beach. And so there are a couple really big catastrophic failures that have happened on Mauna Loa in the last half million years. And so Kona is about up here. And so when we drive down, we are going to, I, oh man, I'm off, Kona's right here. Um, as we drive down, we're gonna go past this place called Kiala Kekua. The ocean will be visible from the road, which is up here. And you will notice there's flats down below. And Kealake Pua Bay, which is where Captain Cook first came to the Hawaiian Islands, so the first um, European person to the Hawaiian Islands, this is where he showed up in Kealake Pua Bay. And there is a scarp that goes from Kealake Pua Bay all the way down through the south point of Hawaii. This is one big long sector collapse. And so as we're driving on the road, we will be driving along here, and when we go to South Point, we will be standing right there. And this whole entire section is a collapse feature. And it can be mapped out using bathymetry and shows that it's actually a few different lobes. And this is from the Mauna Loa rift system, which runs through right here. So these rift systems are really causing problems as they're interacting with the ocean themselves. How am I doing on time? I'm running long, perfect. All right, so then if we go to bigger things where half of an island falls off into the ocean, we can go out to Molokai. And so Molokai was this nice big east-west long volcano and the northern half fell off. And so we built up this volcano, it started slumping, then it just fell off into the ocean north of the Hawaiian Islands. And then we get this rejuvenated volcanism. And here is a younger volcano that was opened up and allowed to bring some land back to the surface. And if we look at the Hawaiian Islands in general, we can map out all of these catastrophic landslides. And I think this is still controversial. Um, in terms of the timing and if there's any sort of climactic um, reason for this. But a lot of these failures, the Helena Poly system, so that's on Kilauea, Kalai, east and west, Mauna Loa, North Kona, South Kona, Polalu, which is on Maui. Um, and then we have these massive sector collapses from Molokai, 
hundreds of kilometers out into the ocean, there's blocks that are bigger than, I don't know what they're bigger than. They're massive. They're really big. Tens of kilometers and miles across. And then also the Ko'olau Mountains also collapsed off about 400 kilometers away from the islands itself. So there's these massive blocks and they're just basalts that have fallen off. When you say collapse, is that a sudden event or is it stretched out over time? That's a, I think the failure is quite sudden. But if we take our thoughts on what's happening at Kilauea, this is something that they watch constantly. And so as it's falling away, you have a new eruption going on. Does that slowly kind of weld it a little bit? And because this is slowly going uphill, does that hold it? And as you get further away, do you no longer have that uphill slope to go against? So it can, so it can go. Was there um, anything living on them at the time? Nope. The, um, the Hawaiian people have only been on the islands for about 15 to 1800 years. So, um, well, not people, but anything. Uh, I'm sure some birds were unhappy. <laughs> um, that I, I, I'm definitely not sure of. Um, there is evidence that some of these collapses would go over a full island of about a thousand feet. Um, there's tsunami deposits on top. So there are tsunamis associated. Yes, um, but they're so old in the record. Oh, sorry, I switched. Um, you know, tens of thousands of years. Our our ability to observe those things is is diminished as we move back. You know, we barely figured out Cascadia um, tsunamis from 1790. You know, and that's only 220 years old. Yeah, about there. So, and this collapse phase can happen at any given time. It doesn't have to happen in between these things. It's just there to just kind of show this is part of the evolution of these <coughs> islands themselves. After our building up of these shield volcanoes, we have the capping stage. And so this is where the volcanoes are becoming very tall you have to have more differentiation to get melts up to the top, and things become more alkalic and less fluid, and so you build steeper cones. And so when we go up Mauna Kea, when you look at Mauna Kea versus Mauna Loa, Mauna Loa is only about 200 feet lower in elevation, and you wouldn't guess that it is even that close, because it just looks like this big, long, broad slope. Whereas Mauna Kea, when you get close, you're going straight up a big hill. But what you can see on Mount Akea is there's all these cones. And so these are cinder cones and, and very short-lived lava flows that are coming off the top of this volcano itself. And so what you're doing is you're taking from this big shield phase and you're stacking cones all on the top of it. And you're also, because you're moving further away from the hot spot, you're decreasing the eruption. So the, all of those activities on um, the cones, they're all different times, they're all, you know, so it's not like a, like a mother cone. No, they're, they, they, the, the vent itself used to be in the middle, and now the eruptions are happening in, in slightly more a random order. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount, and you might have an eruption in one spot, might never happen again and it'll go to another location, and it just kind of slowly building it up over time. How much is the chemical composition changing so that they slide off? So once it starts to get to that um, capping stage, you're only in the, the central part of the volcano. And so probably collapses aren't happening that get into that. But I would say maybe we don't understand as we get to these older uh, volcanoes because we only see the tops and we don't actually see the more fluid lavas further down. So we're losing information as we're growing and falling apart. Um, but as these build up, now we start to use water because we're no longer providing new material. We're falling into the, we're sinking into the ocean slowly and we're also eroding away. And so this is where we start to build reefs and we start to have these really big valleys 
And where we see this are in a place called Kohala, which is on the northern part of the Big Island itself, and the West Maui Mountains. And so the picture on the right is from the exact opposite direction that we will see from the place that we're going up to by Honokaha. This is from the north looking south. We'll be looking from the south going north. But steep cliffs that are very deeply eroded. But then we have rejuvenation. And so this is a less understood mechanism where you actually, after erosion happens, there are places where, and it seems like it happens more on the big volcanoes, where you actually have new volcanic activity far off of the hot spot. And so it could be smearing of that hot melt as it's going to the northwest. And so places that we see this are on Maui at Haleakala. And the last eruption in Haleakala was in like 1790. And so then you have eruptions every few hundred to thousands of years. And Haleakala is very eroded, but you can see these are all eruptions since the last 30,000 years. So there's a lot of eruptions that have happened, and some of these big valleys like this one to the north and that one there are actually erosional valleys. And I wish I would have just taken a satellite image. Oh, those must be old databases. <laughs> so we have some rejuvenation, and we can actually even see post-erosional rejuvenation, like you would see on Oahu. So if you've ever been to Waikiki, Diamond Head Crater, that's young volcanism. Uh, here's another one where the volcano is intersected with the ocean itself. And so you get these tough cones and rings, and smaller vents right near the ocean as this volcano is subsiding. Then you move into the atoll stage. So most of the rock, if not all of it, has sunk below the sea level. And the last bit of Hawaiian basalt is out at a place called Gardner Pinnacles. And then the last bit of land above the water is at Curie Atoll. And this is from a volcano that's about 30 million years old. And there's no material from volcanoes left over. It's just the reef growing up on the edges of the volcano itself. And the reason why things start to sink after this, any ideas? This is at about 28 degrees from the equator. Is there a great reef growth in Southern California? No, the water's too cold. So you're too far away from the equator, it's too cold. You're no longer growing reef as fast as you can to maintain with the sinking of the islands and the erosion of the islands. And so after about 28 degrees north latitude, and we're at 19 degrees north of the equator right now, that's when you start to lose the uh, Hawaiian Islands. And then you move into the last and final stage, the geo stage. And the crazy thing about this evolution is it was first hypothesized by Darwin in the Galapagos. And so this is something that has been thought about for about 170 years, something like that. And so basically at this point, anything older than 30 million years old, and so here's Curie Atoll, is now moving below the ocean. And these go to drowned reefs and drowned volcanoes. And part of it is they're slowly, you know, moving laterally from their high points, and they're slowly sinking as the crust itself is becoming more and more dense until their ultimate demise going in to the trench and being subducted into below either Russia or Alaska, I guess, at this point. All right, so we just ended on a sad note. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but so what's happening with the Big Island? <coughs> and so the big takeaways that I would like you guys to at least have 
is there are five volcanoes that make up this island that we're currently on. We are currently here in Kailua, and we are on Pu'olalai, and you can actually see almost to the top of it when we're on the boat this morning. Is this when I have my arrows? Nope, not when I have my arrows. I went too far. Go back. Boom. All right. So we have Pu'olalai, Mount Oloa, Kilauea, Mount Okea, and Kohala. And so I'm going to just briefly walk through each of these volcanoes, kind of give you some information on what's going on. And we'll start from the north. Nope, I went backwards. Boom. All right, so here's Kohala. It is 5,500-ish feet elevation. And this is an extinct volcano. It last erupted 120,000 years ago. And it is heavily eroded. So when we go um, on an adventure on, I think, Wednesday, maybe, up to Honoka'a, I don't remember. Anyway, so we're going to end up right about here next to Waipio Valley, which is the Valley of the Kings. King Kamehameha was born up in this area who united the whole Hawaiian chain. But these are heavily eroded valleys, and they are headwater erosion valleys. So the rain up here is what's causing the upward migration. And over on the right hand side is Waipio Valley and we'll overlook this uh, in a few days. But from extinct Kohala Volcano. We will also see Mauna Kea Volcano and we're going to go up there and Van's going to lead us up to these telescopes. Um, we'll possibly encounter snow. This is not a picture. I was going to going to do a webcam photo, but I forgot. So, uh, possibly a similar interaction as this. Mauna Kea is over 13,800 feet elevation. It is, it last erupted about 2,500 years ago, and it is the only mountain in the Hawaiian Islands that has evidence of past glaciation. So when we drive up there, it's actually a uh, glacial historical park. And we can actually see the footprint of where the ice cap was. Tell me again the 13,000 is from the bottom bottom? or is it from That is just from sea level. From the bottom bottom is probably more like 34,000 feet. And it could be off by maybe a couple thousand feet. What glaciation is? The last one. LGM. So, and so we will not get there, and I've actually never been there. There's a place called Lake Waiau, which is a, is a very important place in Hawaiian culture, but around it is actually permafrost. So there's still permafrost up there, so it's technically designated a cold desert. Um, and there's cool um, uh, plants that grow up there called silver swords, and they're bright silver, and they're Honestly, kind of like an agave or uh, something like that in their in their uh, look. So we could potentially see them there. And if you ever went to Chaminade University, they're called the Silver Swords, which is after the plant, uh, which is on a wall. The next is Hualalai, which is just that way. And this is kind of a forgotten volcano. It's the one that people think least about but could potentially have most impact on infrastructure here. And so here's a picture of Hualalai. Here's downtown Kailua, Kona. Um, and the last eruptions from Hualalai were in 1801 and 1802. The Kona Air Airport is built on this lava floor. <laughs> and where we're going um, tomorrow, snorkeling, is on this lava flow. So, very active, but kind of underappreciated because it's only 8,000 feet tall. It's just a little guy. It only erupts every couple hundred years. Don't worry about it. Um, so a very kind of forgotten volcano. The next one is Mauna Loa, which is the biggest volcano on the planet. And actually, lava flows from Mauna Loa touch almost two-thirds of all the surface of the Hawaiian Islands, or of the island of Hawaii. So we... If we went a little bit further around Hualalai, we would run into Mauna Loa lava flows. 
the eruption from Mauna Loa, which is this, and here's the main roadway from Kona to Hilo, and it came within a few hundred yards of it, several hundred yards of it maybe, um, came down right along this 1843 lava flow right here, and this is the road we're going to take up to Mauna Kea. So it almost cut off the lifeline of the island. And luckily, Madame Pele was nice and decided to stop the eruption after 17 days. So you all knew that was going to happen? It was going to stop or it was going to erupt? That it was going to erupt. There were plenty of evidence in, from inflation, so GPS looking at the <coughs> inflation of the volcano and volcanic activity, but it erupted at 11 o'clock at night. And the first evidence came from a webcam up here at Makuo Veo Veo. And everybody thought in the early mornings of that eruption, and we'll hear more about this from Ken, who is the main point of contact for dealing with this eruption. All the early evidence said it was gonna come off this way. And the last time it erupted from the Southwest Rift Zone, it made it from the Rift Zone to the ocean in a matter of a couple hours. Wow. It took 17 days, luckily, to go from here to there. And this is the, some of the steepest parts of the island itself. And when we drive towards South Point, every time we cross a lava flow, there's actually a little sign that says the age of that lava flow. Um, and you know, some of these are, you'll see more lichen and more vegetation on some of the older ones, and some of the younger ones, they'll look quite fresh. And when Bill does his talk, when we're in Hilo on Sunday, he's gonna talk about lava flows and lava tubes and there are some parallels to closing New Mexico. Oh, well, here we go. Um, so here's the first image of the eruption uh, in November. And what we see with Mauna Loa, because it's so big, it's starting to choke itself out in terms of its eruptive activity and kind of understanding its frequency. And so it's also erupted so much, and actually I should go back, sorry. This is where I'm getting too excited. So, Mauna Loa, they think, resurfaces, it, resurfaces itself every 10,000 years. So we don't really understand much activity up there beyond about 10,000 years ago. And part of it is that it's really important <coughs> to date things, even with Bill's expertise and possibly the best argon geochronology lab on the planet. It's hard to figure out the age of stuff with low potassium, and that is only 10,000 years old. It's not the correct technique for it, and there really isn't a good technique for it anyway. And so they actually go by when they map this based off of color. And tomorrow what we will see is we're gonna start driving out on black rock from, 19, or from 1801, and then we're gonna see kind of a chocolatey color. And that is a considerably older lava flow, but there's zero vegetation but we can tell by the color that they're slightly different ages, or vastly different ages. And some of these are carbon dated, right? Some of them are carbon dated if, if you have it available. You can get the carbon. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so with Mauna Loa, here's the last eruption from November 27th. And prior to this eruption, Mauna Loa hadn't erupted since 1984. And they thought that it kind of erupted every 10 years. And then it just held off for about 40 years. And the reason why this says there's no information is because it's been resurfaced. And so as we all, uh, as, as geologists understand, you can only map what you see. And if it's below the lava flow, it's, it's lost in history for a while, unless you drill a core. And that's expensive. So what are we looking at here? Thank you. That's a great question. So this is a thermal image of Makuo Veo Veo, the summit caldera of Mauna Loa. And from this point to over there is a mile and a half apart. And so this is a giant sheet of lava that resurfaced most of this caldera. What's the unit on the colors? <coughs> 
Oh, this is in temperature in, um, actually that's a great question. Uh, I'm just gonna go out and say it's in Fahrenheit. Oh no, it, yeah, it could be either or. Um, hopefully not Kelvin. We're in trouble. I can guarantee you it's not Kelvin. It is probably Celsius. I think that's more reasonable. Typical um, eruption temperature is like 1150, 1165, right? Yeah, and I think some kiloas are, are up about 1200 degrees Celsius. It, it's in Celsius now that I'm saying this out loud. Um, so yeah, this would be in Celsius. But as soon as the surface crystallizes or solidifies, it, it's very good at happening, or trapping heat. Um, so this, these, are, these are active outbreak zones. And you know these are giant plates that are, are insulated and everything. And there's probably a distance problem as well. So I don't think the Hawaii Volcanoes Observatory uses this to accurately measure the intensity of the heat. They'll do some sort of thermal barometry to figure that out, looking at mineral assemblages. So this is more like a spreading event, whereas like Tongo was no, the, no, I think like, that's just the pressure air conditioning. Up yeah, it, but water coming in. So if you were to take and drop a, a lot of Olympic-sized swimming pools onto this <laughs> at once. I, yeah, we're Americans, so we use really stupid units, and I can't think of volume. Um, yeah, so if you yeah, if you dumped the Great Lakes on top of that, you would have a gigantic explosion because you have a lot of steam that's being generated at that point. And so that's called magma fuel coolant interaction. And you fracture the melt itself versus allowing the gases to expand like you would have in a sort of... But what's the difference between that and pyroclastic? What's um, the same? So they can be the same, but it depends on what is the fragmentation method. Because you could get both gas expanding or this water interaction both creates pyroclasts, which just means fiery bits. So. so since November and December, is it cooled off? This is a great question. I assume so. Um, I don't think this ended up being very thick because then the eruption that was in the first slide, if you can remember all the way back to last week, um, <laughs> was actually from over here and further down the slope. So this whole area spread open and then erupted here, but then migrated to the north and east. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there. There are, yeah, I guess I'm not leaving it. Um, so at Kilauea, there's a place uh, called Kilauea Iki where there's a gigantic lava pool. And as it solidified, they actually drilled it to figure out the cooling rate of this gigantic stack. And I, I can't remember, you know, how long it took for it to completely solidify, but it was several hundred feet deep of molten lava that pooled into this big crater. I just want to know where I'm supposed to step. <laughs> I think all places we're going to be okay. Uh, as long as it's not flowing under you, if you ever play the okay. game, the floor is lava, it kind of falls into place here as well. Um, I'll, I'll give you a piggyback if need be. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Kilauea Volcano, which is only about 4,000 feet high, and we'll go up to Kilauea, which is where Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is. And what we will see is, unfortunately, not as beautiful as this because it stopped erupting, uh, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before that, on uh, March 7th. Um, and this is the most active volcano in Hawaii. And so down here is a record of eruptions and the duration of each eruption, including violently explosive uh, events. And Kilauea actually erupts explosively about as frequently as Mount St. Helens. And somebody I was talking to earlier about who was in Coeur d'Alene, Washington at the time, or Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, at the time that Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. Um, and some of these are quite a famous events 
like this one, mm -hmm. which was the Keana Kikoi Ash, which actually killed the rival chief from the Kona side as they were trying to go and fight King Kamehameha. They died in a volcanic eruption. And you can, I don't think we'll be able to go out there because it's been closed off, but you can actually see their footprints mm -hmm. in the ash. Wow. Um, it's in a part of the volcano, uh, the national park that's been closed off off and on. So uh, I'm not sure of that, but it's, it's kind of a, a wild thing to think of. So I've, I've seen a scale on the duration of the eruptions <coughs> there. Uh, only goes up, to, it says up to one year, but maybe that's one year per year? Because Possibly, yeah. It's like the last eruption of Kilauea took, was, what, 35 years? Yeah, yeah. no, my, my scale is, is way off on this. So the uh, Pu'uo'o eruption from Kilauea started in 1983 and ended in 2017. <laughs> so this, and clearly my, my timeline is, is off. Yeah, it's essentially, yeah. 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 This, so this is actually a figure from when I left Hawaii in 2010. We didn't, once I left, we didn't worry about it. <laughs> no, nobody worried about it. So, but yeah, so the, the timing of some of these eruptions, and if you see this, it says that there was eruptions at the summit basically the whole time. So um, it's hard to track some of these records for the back of time, because it's so good at covering all the evidence. What's that, what's that second uh, 1925 violent eruption? Which one? The oh, this one? Yeah. So this was a steam eruption at the, um, back when uh, Thomas Jagger was the volcano, uh, or the when he started the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. So there's actually, um, there's pictures of that where people were driving up in like their Model Ts <laughs> on the edge of the caldera watching the steam explosion. Um, I don't think that was as violent as that, although it does have a longer thing. Yeah, I apologize. I don't know. And so if we just take a, a closer look at Kilauea and its activity, and so here's the rift zone, which is slowly going along here, out that way. This part is slowly falling off. This area is actually thought to be safe from volcanic activity because the slump is slowly turning back. It's actually providing a topographic dam. So we'd have to fill in all of this area first to actually make it down that hallway. And the eruption that happened from 1983 to 2018 um, is all of this area. And it was confined mostly within um, mostly uninhabited places. There were two subdivisions that com got completely wiped out. Um, and then as I was getting ready to leave in 2010, it started flowing down through here and started um, reclaiming land where people were living. Then in 2018, after this happened, this stalled out, there was a big eruption down here, which ended up destroying several hundred houses. Um, and when we go to the PGV um, in a few days, we will actually see that 2018 oh. lava flow because it surrounded the Puna Geothermal Ventures, <coughs> but did not actually take it out. So how tall is this one? 4,000 feet. And it's kind of, well, we'll get into that, never mind. <clears throat> and so here's kind of a lateral look at these volcanoes where they think that there is this kind of main conduit coming up, but there's some of these interconnected dike systems along the rift zone itself. And so, you know, when Mauna Loa erupted, I know it's not this volcano, the first thing that was asked is like, is this remobilized 1984 material? And it was not. And when this erupted, the first thing that was asked, is this 1963 eruption from Kilauea, which is the last time it erupted in that area? And it was not. And so they can actually fingerprint and look at these different flows and figure out, is this new material? Is this old stuff that was stuck and had to get pushed out first? And so they can really kind of work through, um, you know, where this melt is actually. Oh yeah, I'm going for like an hour and a half. <laughs> All right, so 
We just talked about the geology, and I almost became a geographer until I took geology of the Hawaiian Islands. But I think this is just an important thing to touch on because this dictates all of our interactions that we're going to have with this island uh, on this trip. And so on the left here, we have the trade winds, which are the prevailing wind direction for the Pacific itself. And this was before we just threw islands up in the middle. And so because we have these really big islands, all the clouds and everything are stacking up on this side from Hilo all the way towards Kohala. And if you look at that, this is where it rains. In Hilo is the rainiest city in the United States, getting over 130 inches of rain a year. Wow. How much rain do we get in Socorro a year? <laughs> yeah, 30. eight to 15 inches. We got 15 inches the last two years. Um, and so these gigantic volcanoes are really big blockers of the prevailing wind direction. And when they do that, they send the wind around both sides and change what is going on. And so if we look at this, down here below Kilauea, this is a place called the Ka'u Desert. So there's a place across the street called Ka'u Coffee. That's from that region of the Big Island. As we go around on Sunday, we'll get down to South Point. This is also a desert, and it's because the wind's just whipping around there. And so that's a great place to get sunburned. It's nice and sunny. Uh, and there's a beautiful green sand beach. Here in Kona, Mauna Loa is so big, it's blocking all of the prevailing wind directions. And the land heats and cools more rapidly than the ocean does. And so in the morning, because it's a 13,000 foot volcano, you have cold air up here that sinks down towards the ocean. And so you have seaward breezes. But then as the volcano and the land mass heats up, this air rises, this becomes a low, then you have air moving back towards it, building up a band of rain here where all the coffee is grown. This is called the Kona wind. It's a daily cycling of wind back and forth because of the elevation of the volcano itself. Then you get to some places up here where you have true desert up by Kauai High, also known as the Socorro of the Big Island. <laughs> And so one of the things that we have is that the Big Island has, and this is, this is actually, I didn't realize this was controversial until this morning, um, somewhere between 8 to 13 of the 14 Koppen Climate Index Zones. Depending on who you ask and what Reddit forum you end up on. Um, <laughs> and people argue about this to, the, to this day. And on our trip, as we go around, we will get to all but one of these. And that is why we get to go back to Socorro and finally get to a true desert. So we are going to start out here in Kailua, move down across Mauna Loa towards South Point, where we will see gigantic sector collapses and fault scarps. Then we will move through the Ka'u Desert up to the rainforests of Hilo and Puna and go up towards Kohala and um, see the rainforest up there by Holoka'a. We will get up to <coughs> the tundra of Mauna Kea as we join Van and go check out the telescopes. And then we will drive all the way back across to Kona. So you're going to get to see a lot of the island itself. Hopefully, you retain maybe some of this. Um, and if not, I'll just answer the questions anyway. Um, but you're, you're getting a, a fantastic tour of, of what this island has to provide in terms of history and an array of terrain and volcanic activity. And so I'm, I'm really excited and, and thrilled to, to share this all with you guys. Um, and to just move on to what's gonna to happen tomorrow, and this is where it is turns into a choose your own adventure. And one option is you don't have to go. That's always an option. Um, 
And if you're not going fishing, we're going to go up to Kehaha Kai State Park. It's about a 20 minute drive north. A lot of it is beautiful paved roads. And then we're going to drive across a lot of flow. And it is bumpy. And for some reason, there are double speed bumps, which will make more sense tomorrow. Um, and what we can do is we can drive and park here at the parking lot. And you can hang out here. It's a beautiful beach. Um, there's bathrooms. Uh, you could go snorkeling in there if you wanted. Um, we saw a giant crab about that big yesterday. Um, and if you wanted, uh, you could continue on to Mahauli Beach, which is about a 15 minute walk, which might have a little bit calmer waters. If you wanted to continue on and be even more adventurous with your hike, you could go over to what is possibly the nicest beach on the island, Maklavena Beach, and there's no road to it. So it's, there's a barrier to entry. And that is about, what did I say? A 30 minute walk across this beautiful lava flow. So it's gonna be hot. And you can go to the nicest beach on the island. And this is like a marsh area here. So these are seeps and springs coming up. Uh, I didn't even get into that part where rain water is infiltrating. Um, but if you come in and venture with us tomorrow, those are your three options. And we're leaving at 10. And we're leaving at 10. Oh, you're going. Oh, no, you're not going fishing. 6 a.m. might be a nicer way to walk across the wall. Um, and by just looking at this Google Earth thing, this is a different age than that, based off of color alone. So. That is not a beautiful lava flow. <laughs> I just want to say. I tell you what, and it might not. Beautiful ropes, ahoy hoy, ah uh ah. -uh. I didn't even get into that. That's all Bill's, that's Bill's realm. So. Uh, I'm sorry I kept you past all of our bedtimes. <laughs> but, but if you have questions, how long do you expect us to be gone from here? Um, so I think what we're gonna do is there's a place that we can get food 